Welcome back to Potter Revisited, episode 8. Today we are discussing chapter 8 of Philosopher's Stone, The Potions Master. Or as we like to call it, Severus Snape needs some therapy. Now this episode you may hear a lot about Shayna's favorite character Snape and me talking about how much I don't like Snape. <laughs> It'll be good. It'll be a spicy, spicy episode. Well, for the first time ever, before we jump in the chapter, we have some new Harry Potter news, something I never thought would happen when we were recording these, because nothing really new in Harry Potter happens that we actually care about. Yeah. But uh, HBO just announced that they are doing a new Harry Potter special airing on January 1st in the new year, and it looks like tons of the cast are going to be in it. I know for sure Dan, Rupert, Emma have all announced they're going to be in it. I'm pretty sure Tom Felton, Jason Isaacs, basically most of the main cast. I feel like the girl who plays Luna and the guys who play the twins do a lot of stuff, so I feel like they'll probably sign up for it too. Neville, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're on it too. Yeah, in the the trailer they announced so many names, it just basically seems like it's most of the main cast. That's fun. And it's been, from what I can see, it looks like the author is not a part of it. I don't know if that was on her part or is on the network's part. But she will appear in archive footage. Since it looks like it, they're going to be looking back at the Harry Potter series and like what it was like to film it. And looking back 20 years as it is the 20 year anniversary of when Philosopher's Stone was released. So from what I can see, most people seem pretty excited about it. This is the first like... Harry Potter content we've gotten a really long time, especially with the main cast. I don't think Dan, Rep Rupert, and Emma have gotten together in a really long time for Harry Potter specifically. So I feel like if this was like three or four years ago, I would have been so excited and I couldn't wait for this and I'd be like wanting to watch it as soon as it comes out. But I feel like now, just after everything I've been through with the author, with Harry Potter, I feel like I probably will watch it, but I just don't feel as excited. Yeah. How do you feel? Well, my first thought is that if the author's not involved, I'm going to like it a lot more than if they involved the author. I also feel like quite a number of the cast you mentioned are people who've spoken out for trans rights and have been pretty public in their statements. Yeah. Daniel, uh, Rupert, and Emma have all released statements. And I feel like a lot of the other cast have also said stuff. And I've definitely seen some backlash online about people about them doing it despite coming out against the author, but I'm like... Yeah. They grew up with this series, too. Every excuse that we have for still loving the series is also their excuse a thousandfold. Yeah. And it's probably bigger for them, since this is what they grew up with. Like, they, this, this is what they lived for 20 years. This was their actual childhood. These are their friends from their childhood. Also, it's just kind of like, I don't know uh, at any contracts if they have any about promoting Harry Potter and stuff, but it's also just like, I don't know if they're being paid or not. They probably are, but I don't know. But it just... I mean, they should get paid. They're gonna have to get on flights. I'm all fine with them getting paid for it. I just hope they do the most they can to remove the author from all of it so that there's a part of me that thinks, like, if I'm going to watch it, I'm going to turn off the part of my brain that is critical, try and turn off the part of my brain that, like, has all these issues and try and just enjoy it mm -hmm. to the best of my ability. Just, like, turn back into 16-year-old me who wants nothing more than to watch this cast sit there and have a chat. But I think it'll be interesting to see how they do it. Like, I don't really watch a lot of shows that do, like, a summarizing episode after the season is over or whatever but I feel like in my mind it's going to be like like I think dating shows do an episode after someone wins where all the people sit on a couch and like look at their embarrassing moments <laughs> and blush and tell weird stories and like I, I'm picturing that like them all on couches like a a really humorous like person there like asking them questions like some kind of like moderator and they're sitting on a couch and chatting and being like, oh, remember when? And oh gosh, that was my first on-screen kiss. And like... Yeah, there's not a lot of information about what it's actually going to be about, but it seems like the original director, Chris Columbus, is going to be there and they're just going to be like reminiscing about things. I'm hoping they'll show a lot of like archive footage. Yeah, stuff we haven't seen before would be very nice. I'd love that since I know they filmed... Like they have re released bloopers and deleted scenes, but I know that Warner Brothers is hiding it because there's so much more that we haven't seen. Where's Peeves? Yeah. We know that they... Exactly. Peeves is out there. Like, dude, that's just the first two movies that he directed. I'm like, there's probably tons of, like, 
cut scenes and stuff that like yeah there's probably like, like where's victor crumb at the wedding because i know they filmed it yeah and they didn't show it and it's not a deleted scene and i want it they owe you that <laughs> i want it i've been waiting i also think it's probably they've got good stuff like the first take of the first scene they filmed because like we don't really know the order they filmed all of the scenes in so, like, it would be funny to see, like, their first scenes being filmed together for the movie. Like, even if it's a bad take, just to be like, wow, look how far they've come. You know, actually, I don't know if this is correct, but I think one of the first scenes they filmed was the end scene where they get back on the train where Harry talks to Hagrid. That might be mentioned in, because I have the film to for that film book. And I remember that because I think that's one of the scenes where Danny Radcliffe was wearing the glasses that he was allergic to, but they didn't know. So that's why his eyes look really watery. You mean the contact lenses? Or he might have been wearing the contacts, actually. Well, he's allergic to a lot of things. Yeah, I don't think glasses would make his eyes watery, but I think it was the it was the green contact lenses that they had the trouble with. That and also the first pair of glasses that were nickel, because he's allergic to that too. Oh my God. <laughs> this poor guy. <laughs> this poor kid. <laughs> yeah, but I'm interesting to see, like... Um, because like, they have a lot of people coming back, so I think it will definitely get a lot of um, other people's interpretations of, like being on Harry Potter that we probably haven't gotten in a really long time. Like, I think Robbie Coltrane's coming back. We have... Oh, fun. Helena Bonham Carter, which will be fun. Yeah, she'll be... Like, we always had, like, the main... We always had the kids, but, like, getting, like, the older actors, I feel like. Like, I think um, Ralph Finney's is coming back, too. So we get Voldemort's opinion. Yeah, so it's just nice to see, like, the whole cast being... I don't know if, if because of COVID and stuff, they'll actually be together on set, but if, if they'll get people's opinions, like, interviews in, like, different areas and stuff. I also wonder if they'll be on set or not, because I thought most of their set was, like, torn down. I mean, there's probably, I know they filmed some, like, corridor scenes in, like, some college in the UK or in Scotland or something. But I do think they have, like, the studio tour, so maybe they'll do a bunch of stuff there. Or, like, in the fake Diagon Alley in California or wherever they built it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just very interesting to see. So, if uh, let, let us know your opinions, if you're excited for it, if you're gonna watch it, if, like, you don't want to watch it, and... And just you know your opinions and everything. And since they've done things like gone back and filmed scenes to like incorporate into like the rides at Universal Studios, I wonder if they'll film a short like scripted like scene. Like I would almost love to see like a Harry, Hermione, and Ron at a coffee shop as grown ups, like around that like the <laughs> final page of the book where it's like a few years later, but just like as grown ups complaining about their day at work, you know, like it's their lunch break and they're catching up and like their kids. Let them, you know, oh, the kids these days, you know? Oh, my kids drive me crazy. Just like nothing that ruins canon, nothing that ruins everything, just them being their characters, but like so tired. <laughs> yeah, but I'll probably watch at some point. I'm probably not going to watch live just because I don't feel like I'm as excited for it, but it, cause it also comes on New Year's Day. And as an adult, I am busy during the holidays these days, which is weird. I also get to do whatever I want. I just don't have HBO Max or whatever it is that it's airing on. That's also the thing, because we're both in Canada, we don't have HBO Max. It would be on a different channel. So I'll just wait until it's, I don't know, on YouTube? <laughs> Might be a while for that. Wait till it's somewhere. But yeah, just interesting to see Harry Potter back in our lives. There's also a TV show coming out that's like quizzing people on Harry Potter facts. And I think it has Helen Mirren. Yes, this is going to be airing after after that. So that's like, um, it's kind of like a championship show. I think Tom Felton's also involved in that. Where it's just, I think it's a Harry Potter trivia game show. And I think this this special is airing after that. So I think it's also a way to get people to watch that. So you watch the, like the game show before, which I don't, I don't care, but I want to be doing trivia. I don't want to watch people do trivia. I almost think it would be cute if like neither of us watch it and then we like watch it together, pausing after each question and like play the trivia game to see if we would win. Because I think we would do pretty well. <laughs> Maybe. Okay. Do we want to dive into the chapter? All right. Let's dive in and talk about some just little little things at the top before we get into our Snape discussion. Yeah, before I get too deep in his dark, beautiful eyes. No. <laughs> before I drown in them. Um, one of the things that really sticks with me at this chapter, just as like a person who is a grown up and therefore always so tired, is that they talk about his astronomy tower class and it being at midnight. I get it. Like it has to be late to see the stars, but midnight on a school night. Like, they have to be up 
in class at midnight yeah. when they have AM classes the next day. And I'm pretty sure that's child abuse. And I know there's clearly a lot of things that are not right that happen at Hogwarts, but this one cannot be justified. Like, yes. I'm not on board for this midnight class situation, especially because it's first years and they have no electives. So they didn't choose to be up at midnight. They're being forced to. It's, it's odd. I, yeah, cause I was wondering if they had late classes on Thursdays to make up for it. Because usually, like, I'm thinking about, like, working. Like, I used to work closing shifts and then be told to work morning shifts but they always had to do it like if I had worked at closing I couldn't work at an opening the next day like legally well they do half at least Harry has like half days on Fridays but it's like he has the afternoon off on the Friday so it doesn't it's not like if his astronomy was on Thursday he gets to sleep in so I don't know it just seems like a bad idea for young growing children's sleep schedules <laughs> Yeah, it is very odd, especially because I think when you're like 11 at that age, you should be sleeping like more. Yeah. Yeah, very, very weird. But you know, it's Hogwarts. I don't think they care about kids' sleep schedules and how well they perform. Here's the theory. Dumbledore does it on purpose because sleep deprivation is like a key thing that like cult leaders and stuff do when they're trying to like brainwash people so they can control them easier. So he's screwing with their sleep schedules. So... He can control them easier. Oh my god. Dumbledore's a cult leader <laughs> Dumbledore. theory. I mean... I mean... It's not a stretch. <laughs> we're gonna have to do an episode, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbledore is a cult leader? Oh man. Prove me wrong. <laughs> so moving on, I'm just saying, one of my favorite parts of the series, especially in the earlier books, is just listening to the description of the castle and all the different classes and like the talk about all the different... like hidden doors, Harry's trying to find his classes, and then just this description where he talks about, like, transfiguration is this, and transcripts at arts, it arts is this, and charms is this, and it's just, like, the very mundane, like, school setup. Live for it. I love it. Yeah, mundane things are great. I, uh, I like the descriptions of the classes. I love the description of the castle. I think it's the kind of thing that, like, really adds to the whimsy early on, and adds to, like, the lighthearted goofiness of magic in the early books where it is more targeted towards children. Things like walls pretending to be doors and stairs that move. Super impractical, but at the same time, not something I would ever suggest changing because it very much aligns with the way I think wizards think. And it yeah. also aligns with trying to keep a book that sometimes has really serious themes into a more lighthearted, whimsical sort of ambiance. What class do you think, based on Harry's description, would, would you like the best? I mean, I think everyone would like Defense Against the Dark Arts the best, in my mind. Like, that's fun, cool, combative magic, you know, weird, dangerous creature. Like, I, I love that. I want to fight evil things with magic. That's fun. I feel very pulled to Charm, just because Charm seems like fun. Professor Flitwick seems like a fun teacher. Yeah, he seems like he's a nice guy. I feel like I would really like Defense Against the Dark Arts. I feel like, I know it's kind of shown as like a hoax in Harry Potter, but I feel like divination would be a lot of fun for me. Like, even though they don't take it seriously, I would love making up dreams to analyze for myself. And as a psych major, I wouldn't mind actually analyzing my dreams, you know? And I love drinking tea. I could stare at tea leaves, sit in a lake. Yeah, I just like to go there just to drink tea. And then Yeah, when they describe that classroom and like it's up in the tower and like it's dimly lit and it's candles and it's smoky, I'm like, that sounds so relaxing and like cozy. You go up there, you drink your tea, you make some predictions. I'm like, that doesn't sound like the most intellectually stimulating of the courses, but certainly the most relaxing for me. <laughs> All right, here you have a point about Quirrell's turban. Yeah, it's nice that they make sure to uh, give you that little foreshadowing. Like, Snape makes Harry feel bad times and uncomfortable, but Snape's looking at Harry right around Quirrell's turban, and they say that so plainly right there, that when you come back, you're like, how did I not know? It's lovely. It's, it's well done. I'll, I will say that I appreciate that bit of foreshadowing. I also really like the slight foreshadowing of McGonagall's spell that she uses in the seventh, the Pure Tatum Locomoto, when she turns the statues into like an army. Yeah. I love that Harry looking at the statues is like thinking about how he's pretty sure they could just walk around. I think that's very cute. Harry's pretty saucy in, the, in this chapter, which I liked. As usual. Oh, I love it. And you have a point of, hey, Grace should never be told secrets. Ever. Like, I don't know if Dumbledore tells Hagrid secrets hoping that they get out because he wants people to know the things. Yeah, I feel like Dumbledore knows and he's aware of it. But, like, 
don't tell Hagrid secrets. Like, I don't know why anyone would ever tell him anything confidential whatsoever. Because the man cannot keep a secret. <laughs> Stop telling him important information. And, like, you trust him. He would never do something bad intentionally. He's clearly a very good-hearted and loyal friend. But you need to keep in mind the things he'll do unintentionally and how very likely and detrimental they can be. It's so hard because you definitely love Hagrid because he's just, like, he's just such a, like, the kind of guy you... Like, admire and stuff. He's just, like, the words to any kind of, like, responsibility. Yeah. You love him, but you're like, oh, you should not be doing this. You're an adult. So you have a point here about just, like, how we kind of get the kids and, like, how they're, how they are academically. Yeah. I mean, early on, they, they show you that Hermione is already the glowing, like, top of the line student, works hard, tries hard, excels, succeeds. And Harry and Ron are already kind of like, this is hard. Yeah. Do we want to do it? Eh. Like, you, early on, you understand who's, who's trying really hard in class and who is distracted and not going to be doing their homework. Well, I feel like Harry and Ron are definitely typical 11-year-old boys. And I feel like Harry, it's different for him at this school because I was thinking about this last night that at his old school, he might have been doing more better academically because he didn't have friends and there's nothing else for him to do but here he has friends and other stuff to do and ron is definitely like a normal 11 year old who maybe isn't as like i feel like they both do well but they're not overachievers like hermione and so that they definitely have other priorities and harry kind of has this like um opportunity where he's able to hang out with friends and choose that over kind of school because he has options now he has things he can do or I feel back with the Dursleys and Dudley, he didn't have those choices. I also wonder how much of it is a bit of like a trying to fit in better with Ron. Like Ron isn't like outwardly confident or anything, but he's more comfortable existing in that world. And if the person Harry's around is Ron, who's kind of like, okay, I'm done trying to do my homework. I'm ready to slack off. For Harry, it's easier socially to just agree and slack off, sort of like what you're saying, he has friends. But like if the first friend Harry had made and become close to was Hermione, I think there's a chance... Harry would have been a bit more academically inclined just because he starts off his magical student career as trying harder and studying harder. But because his first close friend who knows about the wizarding world and being a student there is kind of like, meh, we'll, we'll kind of try. Do we have to do our homework? Harry's like, okay, this is acceptable and normal here, you know? Ron is teaching him bad habits. Oh, Ron. So I was saying, um, Talking about other things, Neville kind of struggles, and we kind of see him struggling with um, all his classes, basically, except for herbology. And he ends up in the hospital wing, like, a number of times. And he's like, this is their first week, and poor Neville is just not having a good first week. Uh, I just, uh, poor Neville. <laughs> I'm just saying it over and over again. Poor Neville. Yeah, poor Neville. He gets, he gets a lot of, he goes through a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he uh, really... He comes out on top, but he, he goes through it. Yeah. I think to an extent, because Neville could have been the chosen one, they also try and throw, like, Harry's almost murdered a couple times in the year and stuff. So they're like, we also need to have Neville's life not be perfect also. Because I feel like that could, later on, when Harry sort of learns more about the prophecy, lead to a bit of resentment if Neville has had this perfect, flawless, happy life. But because Neville's life's been pretty shitty, too that never becomes sort of an option. Yeah. Also, I noted that Harry is worried about losing two points in this chapter, and I just think, just do wait, Harry. Just do wait to, not even, like, at the end of this book, but even, like, the, near the end of the series, Harry's losing, like, hundreds of points, and he's like, yeah, whatever. So it's very cool to see, like, how house points are such a big part of, like, a worry in, like, in this book, and in later books, like, they don't even care about house points anymore yeah i feel like it's a little bit early on harry just started to learn about gryffindor being his family and he wants to contribute positively to that family and fit in so he's worried about house points for the social repercussion of losing them yeah but then also losing house points seems like a big deal early on when you're like 11 the primary concern of my life is fitting in with friends at school but a few years later when the primary concern is not dying or not having your best friends be terribly murdered school spirit becomes so much less important. <laughs> yes. <laughs> He's like, the worst thing that ever happened to me was I lost five house points. And now it's like, the worst thing that ever happened to me is my godfather died in front of me. Yeah, oh, poor Harry. And also a bunch of other people. <laughs> like, the trauma adds up and house points suddenly just yeah. don't become important. I find it nice and interesting and very good for Harry how quickly he sort of draws conclusions about the vault and the break-in. Like, he sees the newspaper article. He's like, wait a minute. 
And he's immediately starting to sort of form his theories and plot to manipulate Hagrid a bit to get information. And it's very clever of him, which is nice when Harry gets his clever moments. Yeah. But also, like, he sort of quickly jumps to, like, time to figure out how to get more information out of Hagrid, which is very Slytherin of him. Yeah. (laughs) He's like, how can I manipulate him into telling me more information? Because I am curious. Yeah, I wonder how, like, I don't know if I was this kind of, like, kid, but I think it just... It's just, like, happenstance how both Harry, Ron, and Hermione are all very, like, interested in this, like, mystery that doesn't really concern them. And I feel if, like, I was living, I, it would be like, oh, yeah, that's weird, but you wouldn't, like, think about it. But because they just have, like, something about them that's, like, I need to know and just open up to this whole thing. Yeah. I mean, it could be a little bit of the Gryffindor. They, yeah. they, they want adventure and it's, like, an option for adventure. They're like, this could lead to crazy shenanigans. So we should investigate. But also, I mean, I love a mystery. I certainly, I think if some sort of strange happenings were going on and I realized I was somewhat involved, I would immediately be like putting on my detective hat and getting ready to solve some crime, you know? Yeah, maybe. Who knows? I think it's particularly interesting that Harry is so fully on board for it and Hermione because like everything is already so new. Like they still have so many more little mysteries to solve in their day-to-day life at this point as people who are raised by muggles. That like this, this sh- it's crazy how quickly they're kind of like bored enough with everyday life to really go looking for their own new trouble because everything should be so new still. <laughs> like I think I would be looking for mysteries, but not this early on in my first year. You know? Yeah, just shows what kind of kids they are. Very intuitive. Gryffindors. <laughs> so we both kind of have a point about um, Hagrid knowing about Snape and James rivalry and why he doesn't tell Harry because it seems like he may know yeah it kind of feels like Hagrid has a bit of a deeper understanding about that Snape marauders sort of yeah because we know that Hagrid was in the order with James and Lily but he was also obviously a a gameskeeper when they were at school so I don't know how close they were when they were at school but he's probably aware of them I'm assuming because the marauders I feel like the whole school knew about them and the shenanigans they got up to yeah rivalry is a good way to put it hatred because <laughs> Harry asks him straight up like why does he hate me or like I feel like he hates me and Hagrid's like yeah no no he doesn't why would he hate you but I just feel like Hagrid some point where Hagrid knows more than he says but he doesn't blurt it out for the first time I don't think he knows all of the deeper underlying reasons I guess he just sort of remembers Snape being this dark quiet Slytherin boy who didn't get along with these, in Hagrid's mind, definitely fun, interesting, friendly, and jovial Gryffindors. So it's probably Hagrid's better at keeping that secret because it just seems like it's not as important. Like when he holds a big secret, he's like holding back information. But when it doesn't feel that important, like, oh yeah, they didn't like each other very much in school. It's easier for him. I feel like Hagrid holds a lot of respect for the professors at Hogwarts. And even when they do start qu- saying that Snape's evil, he's like, no, he's a professor. Like, he he wouldn't be like that. So I feel like he probably knows that Snape and James don't like each other at school. But he doesn't want to turn Harry against, like, a professor, like an authority figure. I wonder if Hagrid does that out of respect for professors and admiration for them. Or out of respect for Dumbledore and blind admiration that Dumbledore would only ever hire someone who is morally pure and... Yeah. <laughs> oh, Hagrid. Because I feel like after Dumbledore dies and when um, Harry is telling everyone that Snape killed him, I feel like Dumbledore, like, like Hagrid's, like, really devastated. Not just because Dumbledore died, but also because it was a professor and it was Snape this whole time. Yeah. And he's like, Snape, I never liked him. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, because I just feel like... Harry has this opinion that, like, his teacher doesn't like him, and everyone kind of knows why Snape doesn't like him, but no one tells him, and it's just, like, I, I hate that. It's like, when you know something is going on, and you just have this feeling that something's, like, going on, and you know people know, but they won't tell you, would drive me nuts. Yeah, I don't like being not in on the secret, especially if it yeah pertains to me. I don't even know why they just couldn't tell him. And also, it might have been nice for Harry to know that, like, Snape doesn't really hate you. He doesn't know you. You're a fine kid. He dislikes you because you remind him of your dad and him and your dad didn't get along. Yeah, I feel like that would have been fine to know at 11. And so Harry might dislike a Snape a bit for that, but he won't be as likely to like internalize the way Snape treats him because it'll be easier for him to say, he's not intentionally treating me like crap. He's subconsciously treating my father like crap. Of course, maybe they wanted, didn't want to say it because then they'd have to admit that like, oh, a teacher actually is like being mean to a student just because he didn't like his dad. And that's kind of effed up. And why should a teacher be doing that? But you know, Dumbledore doesn't care about that stuff. No, Dumbledore is... Harry's emotional well-being? Not necessary. <laughs> 
Snape's emotional well-being, not relevant. So we have a point about Peeves and Filch. Yeah, I just find it interesting that neither of them is particularly likable or on Harry's side in any way, yet they're both such complete opposites. It's such a nice way of looking at, like, characters depth-wise. Like, neither of them is evil. Neither of them are on the side of Death Eaters. They're not bad people. They're just not nice. Like, they're not villains. They're just not nice people. But also, they're nice people. They're not nice people in completely opposite ways. And it's so nice to like get such a broad expanse of like different ways people can be good guys and bad guys, nice people and not nice people. I think it's quite, uh, quite delightful. I kind of like the idea as like Peeves being sort of this chaotic neutral where he like does what he wants. He has no particular side he takes in most issues. Yeah, he just wants to cause mischief. He doesn't care who it affects. If it affects a professor, it affects a student. I think he does like doing things to make Filch angry because they just have like this rivalry the whole series. I agree. It's a... Uh, yeah, we have Filch who's just a really bitter guy who just like... Is a sucker for the rules and hates anyone that breaks them. Yeah, well, I think it's more not even the rules. I just think he likes having some authority over the students because we know that he's a squib. And, and so it probably is really difficult to him for being in a magic school of all of these kids that are learning magic that he probably didn't get to be part of but I feel like him having some authority over them he kind of lords it over them and yeah we do know like he does get mad at them for like really insignificant things and he's just a really bitter guy I feel like if he was if there was a gender caretaker that was like nicer to the students maybe that there wouldn't be as like a, a hatred between him and the students my theory that I mentioned in a previous episode about how I think he's also kind of a poltergeist that's just like the counter to Peeves, like he's there to counterbalance the chaos with strict rules. I feel like if he is not that, if he's just a normal squib, it is so cruel to have him have that job at Hogwarts. A, he's heartbroken over not being able to do magic, and every day he gets to see a bunch of whiny brats use magic actively against him sometimes. And then also, it would be so much faster and easier for a magic person to clean up any of the messes he has to clean up, and yet they've got a squib out there doing it without magic? Like, I don't know how... It doesn't seem fair. I don't know why he's there. I feel like they could have found someone who wouldn't have been as miserable. Like, there's places Filch could be happier. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Dumbledore has a reason for keeping him around. Because I feel like most of the staff, Dumbledore wants them there for a reason. Like, we know Trelawney's there because she gave the prophecy and Snape's there because, obviously, for this reason. And so he, keep, and he, he keeps Hagrid there for a reason. So I feel like there must be something there that Dumbledore's like, I need to keep him here. Because yeah, it just feels like it's a job but, and he obviously is housed. But it just feels like it's not a great job for him or good for his mental health because he's angry and bitter all the time. And I feel like he could get a different job, different place, and then he's not surrounded by bratty kids. But yeah, I just feel like Dumbledore keeps him there for some reason. Yeah, I mean, I'd be miserable being surrounded by bratty kids all day. <laughs> yeah, and also, he, he always complains about what Peace does to him, and so I'm just like, he's like, nope, I'm not gonna banish him. Because his whole life's mission is to get Peace banished from the school. Yeah, which is an admirable goal. I feel like as, as kids, you don't like Filch on principle because you side with the kids. But as an adult, I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, I get it. Because I'm at the point where kids do bother me. Yeah, they're pain. <laughs> so, I mean, he's not a nice guy and he's too close with Umbridge for me to think he's a good person. But yeah, he's definitely an awful guy and whatever but you can definitely see some of his side as an adult dumbledore better have a really good reason for keeping him around is what i'm going to say like yeah, if anyone has any theories but why maybe he's like researching him maybe he likes to keep track of the squibs in um the world just so he could use them for potential purposes like how he has miss fig telling harry for most of his life i wonder if because Salazar Slytherin's original concern with Muggleborns wasn't pure racism, like they're not as good as us. It was fear that because they're close to Muggles, they would tell their families and then Muggles would know about witches and wizards and hunt them down and burn them all. But what if Dumbledore sort of had a bit of that worry too? So his theory was he would find the squibs that are really bitter about being squibs because they're the people who maybe don't have a muggle family but are the most bitter about the magical world because they grew up in it and suddenly can't participate in it and they know about all these things but they can't do them. Mm. So maybe it's almost like 
he thinks Filch, as a squib who's incredibly bitter, would be a risk to the wizarding world. And the only way he can keep an eye on him is by keeping him at Hogwarts. That's very interesting. Because he's bitter enough to do something. Like, I could see Filch. <laughs> yeah. I definitely would like to talk about squibs more in the future, probably when we get to the next book and we find out Filch is a squib. It would be a good time to discuss all about the squib culture, since it's not, it's like this really weird thing in the wizarding world. But I think it is time for us to finally dive into the Snape discourse. I will let you take it away since this is basically, this is your section. <laughs> this is for me. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the potions master, Severus Snape. Severus Tiberius Snape. <laughs> um, so I guess one of my earlier thoughts about Snape is it's interesting that he, he's clearly mean. Like he's not a nice guy. You get that. I understand that. But he isn't at all like evil as in not on the side of good yet. He still is such a complex dude, but he's, it's, it's interesting because he's almost an earlier example of the difference between between being good and evil isn't often isn't just being nice and not nice because he's not nice but he's good you know what i mean like he he's on the right side he just isn't nice mm -hmm. which is good because i think as a child growing up one of the earlier sort of things in your mind is if someone's nice to me they're a good person but that's very much not true i mean barty crouch jr in disguise was very nice to harry but he was a terrible person who wanted to kill him so it's sort of nice, just as, a, again, a broader understanding of good and evil and the complexities there in between. Yeah. But I think Snape, to some extent, is, like, a bit of a shitty red herring. Like, it's just so obvious. Like, they make him so obviously... They portray him so hard as being the villain in this book that, like, even young me didn't really... Like, immediately... I always trusted him. I was like, nah, he's a good guy. Just because they lean so hard... I think that might just be a compliment to, like, how a good of a, like, uh, reader you were, that you were able to pick that up. Because I think it, they do make it pretty obvious in this book, at least, because it's meant to be a children's book. But as the series goes on, they kind of keep the theme of, is he good? Is he bad? You don't know. I just, I think it's very interesting as a character to have put in a kid's book. The amount of layers they have to Snape is very nice. And I guess it works because the more you learn about him and the more complex he gets, the older you are as a reader. So I guess that's timed well. But I think maybe in when I read the first book, I was maybe a little bit above the reading level of the mystery of Snape at that point, And I was already like, nah, he's not the bad guy. <laughs> I mean, you read this after you read, like, The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So, I mean... Yeah, but, but those were... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those were my first books, though. <laughs> um, so it just, I don't know. It seems like they he wasn't a very good red herring for me. Like, I kind of was so sure it wasn't him that I didn't, like, I was already coming up with other suspects sort of the entire time. Yeah. And every time they're like, look how shady Snape is, I was like, yes, I get it. You want me to think it's him, but it's not. <laughs> it's just not him. I'm sorry. Yeah can't be. So the interesting thing I think about Snape is that he is a very good potion maker and it's obvious that he has like this very like the way he feels about potions is very like personal and he has a lot of respect for it but we know from Percy earlier that he doesn't want to teach potions he wants to teach defense against the dark arts. Yeah I think Snape likes potions in that he's good at it and people like things they're good at and I think he likes the exact science of it because as he's a person who I think, I think he's a person who's often like judged and treated a certain way based on what house he's in or the fact that he looks evil or like all these things. And with potions, there's none of that involved. There's no like subjectivity, I guess. Like it's, it's. I think with potions, there's no really chance. There's like, you just, it's, it's like you have natural talent or you have to like, it's like something you have to refine. It's not like you can just kind of like cheat your way through it. Yeah, it's sort of all, it's an exact science. I think he likes that it's reliable in that if you make the potion with the right ingredients in the right way every time, the results will be the same. And I think he likes that. It's reliable and it's exact. But I also think of it like, for me as a person who has a lot of like anxiety and depression issues, I find small tasks that you see through from it being nothing to like being a completed task really absorb my attention enough that they really help me cope like, they distract me from a lot of my 
issues and my stress. So things like painting my nails. I don't like having painted nails, but I paint my nails because it's a task that makes me stop, slow down, focus on something small, and then have an end result I can look at and say it's better now. And I think potions might, to some extent, do that for Snape. Like you have to count how many times you stir the cauldron. You have to make sure you properly slice the right amount of whatever. And because it's so grabbing of the, all the focus. Yeah, it probably would be good for that since it's so involved and you have to pay attention. Yeah, so it probably takes away a lot of his like, the part in the back of his mind that's always blaming him for Lily and stressed out about Dumbledore and stressed out about Voldemort. It's just sort of like, it's not his passion, but it's a helpful coping mechanism he has to distract him from all of his stress. And so I think it's probably very helpful for him in that way. But I think it also, to some extent, makes him think of Lily because it was Lily's favorite class was Potion. So yeah, she also excelled at it as well. So yeah, it somehow makes him feel like close to her maybe. But that's sort of how I feel. That's where I stand on Snape and Potions. It's his coping mechanism that he's good at (laughs) and... It's not his passion, but it's good for him. <laughs> yeah, my point was, is, is he actually a good teacher? Because I, going to college, um, I had a lot of professors that were, like, really high up in the industry. Like, I had tons of years of experience. But you have people that are really good at something, but then you also have, can they actually teach? And I had professors who were brilliant and had also experience, but they could not teach at all. And I feel like this is kind of Snape with potions where he's so good at it and everything makes sense to him, but he cannot relay that in a way that makes sense to first years or just anyone. He just kind of leaves it up to them and he's obviously he's kind of cruel and he doesn't help people and he favors people from his own house. And I'm just like, how is this like a thing? I think he's not a good teacher from the get go. Like, To me, a good teacher is somewhat empathetic. They understand if you don't understand, even if they don't. If they understand and you don't, they can at least be like, oh, I'm sorry, let me slow down. They need to be able to explain things in different ways. And they need to be willing to, like, let you ask questions and answer them without judging you. And Snape is not that person. He's, you don't feel comfortable asking Snape questions. So I do not think he is a good teacher. But I, A, don't think he wants to be. Like, I think if Snape was teaching Defense Against the Dark Arts to a group of people he didn't hate, and neither Dumbledore nor Voldemort would find out anything that happened in the classroom, I think he would be a completely different teacher. But he has a lot of other pressures on top of him when he's teaching. Like, if he teaches Harry something particularly helpful, Voldemort could become mad at him. You know what I mean? And if he's not nice enough to some of the Death Eaters kids, he could get in trouble. And if he's too nice to some of the kids that aren't Death Eater kids, he could get in trouble. So he's doing a job that he doesn't really want to do. And he's kind of like walking on eggshells all the time because he needs to treat certain people the right way in order to make his actual other secret job easier for himself and not risk the lives of people he cares about. So, well, yeah, even looking back, he didn't want to be a teacher. It was like he was blackmailed into it by Dumbledore. Like Dumbledore said, I will do this for you. But since you owe me, you are going to be a teacher at my school. Yeah. And at least he had the brains. Severus Snape had the brains to know he didn't want to be a teacher. And he doesn't. You can tell he, if anything, I think he, he enjoys talking about potions sometimes. and He loves talking about magic. And I feel like he would do well maybe if he were given a couple of advanced students in like Defense Against the Dark Arts who could understand and comprehend things at a higher level and they could like do magical dark arts experimentation or things like that. But he would not do well with a room full of kids. He would not do well with people who don't have what he considers to be a basic understanding of magic. He And he knows that. Well, we see that, obviously. Right? That's Teaching is like his cover story, and he has to do it right. And performing it right means being an asshole to Harry Potter. <laughs> and others. I was wondering, because looking back, I remember that Slughorn was Snape's potions teacher. And we know Slughorn also had this, like, blunt favoritism to those that he knew were going to excel or those that were from like really important families and he's basically anyone he thought could be famous or well known he collected them and Snape kind of does this but it's just with the Slytherin students so I don't know if that's his way of getting back because I don't know if Slughorn really appreciated him because he was from like this he was from a poor family he had a single mom like he wasn't well known but he was good at potions but I feel like Slughorn didn't take to him the way he took to Lily and if it's this way to get back at Slughorn from, like, overlooking him, 
and everything. So he presents his like favoritism to students. Mm. I feel like Snape doesn't think about Slughorn often or really resent Slughorn because I think Snape was gifted enough at potions that like by his second year at Hogwarts, he would probably have been invited to the slug club because like Ginny gets invited not based on blood status, but based on being good at curses and magic. And Slughorn's like, wow, she's smart. I want her in my crew. So I feel like Slughorn starts by collecting people who come from families because he expects that's the status symbol. But if I think a student showed a particular degree of proficiency, especially at potions, I think Slughorn would be like, yes, I want you to be a part of this. Uh, but I don't think Snape really cares. I just, I just found Snape, Snape's probably a very unlikable. Like, he's very into himself. And if you look at Jenny or other people he invited, they have very, like, bright personalities. And I feel like that matches Slughorn. So he goes for people that, like, he wants to spend time with. But, like, I feel like Snape it was definitely not a very likable person as a child. So he, he brought Lily in because she was also good at potions, but also she was probably pleasant to be around. But Snape's very, like, into his, like, what he's doing, and I don't think he would have played along that well with Slughorn. Yeah, I think that, I, I, do we know whether or not Snape was in the Slug Club? Because in my mind... I don't know if it's ever referenced. I know Lily was, but I feel like it would... In my mind, Snape was good enough at potions that Slughorn would invite him, even if he doesn't particularly like him. Just have him sit at the table quietly and mind his own business, as Snape probably would have done at a slug meeting, just on the off chance that he becomes a brilliant and famous potioner, you know? But also, I think Snape is capable of manipulation enough that if Slug Club is a fun party event type group where people of different houses can hang out outside of school hours. There's no way he wouldn't manipulate Slughorn enough to be in that just to be around Lily. Because there aren't a lot of places that Slytherins and Gryffindors can hang out. So if you're good at potions and you know Slughorn likes that, I can't see Snape not using that as an excuse to spend time with Lily when James can't be there because there's no way James was in Slug Club. I feel like he probably could have been in Slug Club, but I just don't think he cared. James had his own things going on. Yeah, I feel like if he was invited, Sirius would have made so much fun of him. I feel like the Marauders never wanted to go to their own parties. They always wanted to go to the ones they were uninvited to. Yeah. I I get that with James and Sirius. Yeah, maybe Lupin was in the slug club. Maybe they were invited and they did something. They just did something and they got kicked out. That's how I see it. Yeah, I don't think... But I think that's how I view Snape when it comes to, like, Slughorn, is I think he probably didn't care much, was good at potions, and manipulated Slughorn enough so that he could spend time with Lily. That was probably it. But when it comes to, like, collecting students and favoritism, I think maybe because Snape didn't see himself as a teacher, as a potions teacher, and he was por- sort of playing that part, he might have just taken traits that he that had been modeled to him. Like, he knows what potion masters are like because he had one as his teacher, which was Slughorn, and Slughorn did collecting of students and stuff and had favorites, So he's copying that because it's a believable way to be potions master because a potions master did it. Yeah. It's also good to know that maybe because like Slytherin obviously has a lot of like families that are Death Eaters. So I wonder if he chose favorites because he wants the kids of these Death Eaters to know that this teacher like is kind of like on their side. And I feel like that's maybe what Dumbledore wanted. He wanted him to like... There's a professor, because I know a lot of the death the Slytherins' parents don't like Dumbledore, so he wants them to have a professor that they think is on their side, so they know that they have, like, they think that they have someone. Because we know that Draco talks a lot about, he talks Snape up a lot to his dad, and his dad really likes Snape. Yeah, exactly. Snape, Snape plays the part of being on the side of the Death Eaters by treating Death Eater children special. And it's part of his job. Like, I'm not saying if Snape wasn't a double agent and wasn't being watched constantly by both the good guys and the bad guys and didn't have to play his part so well, he would be a nice guy. Because I don't think he'd be particularly nice that way either. He's, you know, doesn't want to be a teacher. He's still really bitter about Lily. He hasn't gotten over it. He doesn't like Harry. But I think he would be significantly different if he wasn't playing the role that was handed to him, which is pretend to be the potions teacher while being my spy. So he has to be believable in so many ways. Yeah, if he had, instead of being blackmailed by Dumbledore, he went and got therapy, maybe he'd be better. (laughs) He needs therapy. Yeah, Dumbledore, why did you not let Snape get therapy? He needs therapy. He need. I mean, everyone should be in therapy, but Severus Snape really needs therapy. Yeah, he has a lot to work through. Yeah. So we had a point here about um, his cruelty to Neville 
making it seem more normal because then it's not to just Harry that he's just mean to all the Gryffindors, but he really singles out Neville and Harry in the series. Yeah, I mean, he definitely hates Neville because the prophecy could have been Neville and so probably blames Neville a smidge for Lily's death. Again, he shouldn't, but he probably does subconsciously. But also, again, he needs to be believable enough to the Death Eaters, but he also needs to be believable enough to the parents of non-Death Eaters. So he kind of can't just super duper bully Harry significantly more than everyone else because then he's not playing the part of good guy, nice dude on the right side who works at Hogwarts. He needs to play that part as much as he needs to play the I love Death Eaters, woohoo, good job, you little brats. So it's a balancing act, I think. And Neville, I mean, I don't want to say Neville is an easy victim, but Snape can clearly tell that Neville's someone who has a rough time. And so it's probably really easy for Snape to just do that, which is an awful thing to say and not one of the strong points of my pro-Snape argument. But I think... I think it's partially trying to cover up that he particularly hates Harry and partially just doing his job of being double agent-y. Well, he definitely probably takes a lot of his bitterness out because he's kind of forced into this role out on the students, particularly Harry and Neville, who have done nothing to him. Yeah. I mean, if we actually go back to the subject of Snape and therapy, which could be a whole podcast, not just a whole episode, (laughs) but he went from having, being in love with Lily losing Lily, not having any support whatsoever for that because his parents sucked, his friends were Death Eaters, and Lily was his only, like, stable friend, to, like, being with the Death Eaters, who he couldn't talk to about what he'd been through because they were Death Eaters and she was a Muggleborn. So he really couldn't... I don't think anyone sat Snape down ever and were like, talk about how you felt, talk about what you went with, like, what you went through, how did it feel losing her, what could you have done differently? What should you have done? How can you continue your life? How can you let go of the feelings of like regret you have about yourself? How can you let go of the feelings of anger you have towards these other people? Like no one sat him down and talked to him about healthy coping me- mechanisms and no one gave him an opportunity to just like talk about his feelings in a way where he could be like, okay, you're right. She's not going to love me. I can't change who she's in love with, but I can be a friend worthy of her love as a friend and I can work towards that and be that person or I can take acknowledge that I am responsible for her death and want to work towards finding a way that in my mind she'll forgive me but I also need to take care of myself and find a way to forgive myself for me you know but no one ever did that for Severus Snape so he had all this anger and stress no one taught him any coping methods and then they surround him by people that are constant reminders of what he's been through so he has no output I mean I feel like that's a Dumbledore problem Dumbledore was the one he kind of confided in and Dumbledore used it to manipulate him and to force him into this role for his own gain for his reasons and Dumbledore is the one that forces Harry and Snape who don't like each other to be in close proximity to each other all the time and he's always telling them like oh you got it you have to do this like Harry tells them all the time like Snape doesn't like me Snape's mean to me and Dumbledore's like oh you have to call him Professor Snape it's like oh he doesn't he it's not that it's fine like it's yeah I Dumbledore really weaponized Snape's heartbreak and trauma that's what it is he weaponized it and Severus Snape didn't really have a fighting chance. Like, he was sort of a kid when he lost his friendship with Lily. And from that point on, he never had anyone. And, like, you can blame him a little because at one point he became a grown man and still never got help. But he didn't know he could. Like, there was no, who was he going to go to for help? Like, now you're a Death Eater. All your friends are Death Eaters. I'm sure they don't have therapy on budget for the Death Eaters. He can't talk to any of them. I don't think anyone went to therapy. Because I think that's probably, like, the 80s. And if he went to talk to... Anyone else who wasn't a Death Eater, he's betraying the Death Eaters. And then when he's a double agent, like, no one really stopped to care about his feelings. I care about his feelings. I mean, I really don't care about his feelings, but I can acknowledge. I think good therapy could have been the absolute difference. Or at least a good friend that stuck with him at some point. I think some good influences. And he would have been... I mean, he still would have done his job. You know, he still would have been a double agent and he still would have hated being a teacher, but he might have been a little nicer to some of the students. Maybe. And I think he would have been a lot less miserable. You know, that's where I stand. I've decided that uh, since I don't like Snape and he is an asshole for most of the series, I am going to start a Snape sucks count 
for each time that he's an asshole for no reason. And he gets one point for this episode for how he treats Harry slash the Carpenters in his class. Okay. And we will see how far we get at the end of this book. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying he's not an asshole. I'm just saying, you know, he, ha- he, he, he never really took the time to find ways not to be an asshole. <laughs> he was too busy doing everything Voldemort and Dumbledore told him. <laughs> Poor guy. Okay, do you have any closing remarks for this episode? Not too much, just that Snape sucks and he's not a good teacher. <laughs> what about you? Uh, my closing thoughts are he's not a teacher. He's a double agent playing the part of teacher. And, um, <laughs> uh, you know, just talk about your feelings, everybody. Find someone you can rely on. Sit down, have a cup of tea. Talk through your trauma. <laughs> and then don't take it out on children. Therapy is worth it. All right, that's it for us for this episode. And join us next episode as we dive into chapter nine of Phosphor Stone, The Midnight Duel. Of course, if you have any thoughts on this episode or future chapters or previous episodes, you can reach out across social media to us at Potter Revisited, or you can email us at Potter Revisited Podcast at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.